In this video, I'm going to talk to you about my number one guitar, which is this very Parker Nightfly right here that I've modified and upgraded. Now, I have a separate 30 minute video on this channel that explains the stock Parker Nightfly in extreme detail, so I won't be doing that today. However, I will be summarizing the details that led to each of my upgrade decisions, and along the way, I'll tell you the price and my opinion on the upgrades and was it worth it or not. If you have any questions about a particular detail on the Parker Nightfly, I recommend watching the other video. I'm sure I cover it there. Now, the first step in this process was selecting a particular Nightfly model, and there were two main considerations here. Number one, the weight and the body thickness, and number two, the piezo electronics. Luckily, I had already owned several Nightflies from different years, so I could compare exactly what I liked about each era when making this decision. The earliest Nightflies, like this one back here, they're fairly thick and around eight pounds. And the later models, the models that were made right before the company shut down, those were a lot thinner and a lot lighter, like this one over here. This one is about 6.6 .6 pounds, so it's very light and very thin. Now, I've always been drawn to lightweight, thin body guitars because I personally don't believe much of any electric guitar tone comes from the size or weight of the body itself. Thus, having a heavy or thick body is an unnecessary hassle for me personally. I've also spent the last 18 years commuting with my guitars on buses and trains between New Jersey and New York City, carrying my guitar along with camera gear, textbooks, laptops, amps, pedal boards, and so on. Point being, every pound really does count in that type of situation. Also to this day, I feel a very special connection with my thinnest Parker guitars. Um, I have one P48 that was my main guitar for over a decade, and I also have this very thin knife light over here. It's kind of hard to explain, but these guitars fit snugly into my body when I'm playing, and I feel as though I can navigate every inch of the instrument with very minimal body motion, and that's very comfortable for me. So after this assessment, I knew I wouldn't be choosing any of the knife flies V1 through 4, the thick body ones. But the issue with the thinnest knife flies like this one is that they need a 9 volt battery to function. Now, I discussed this in greater detail in the other video, but in short, the oldest Parker Nightfly models have a push button switch, and that takes the piezo and the uh, 9 volt battery completely out of the loop, and so you can use the magnetic pickups even if you don't have a 9 volt battery in. The later models don't have this button, and as a result, they require a 9 volt battery even when you're just using the magnetic pickups alone. This may seem like a small issue, but after years of playing models without the button, I did it for over a decade, I can promise you that the 9 battery will always, always die at the worst possible time. And no matter how many 9 volt batteries you buy in bulk, there's always going to end up being a moment when you have to disable a smoke detector to get a battery to finish a recording or really exciting practice session. So this was my first trade-off. I went with a Parker V5. It's thinner than the V1 through V4s. It's also lighter than the V1 through V4, but again, it's not as light as the latest ones. It does, however, have that crucial stereo mono switch, and it also has the roller bridge saddles, which I do slightly prefer. To be completely honest, I'm still very tempted to remove all of the electronics and the bridge from this guitar and put it in one of the later models, the later bodies that are nice and thin. Um, and honestly, as I'm talking about it with you right now, I'm getting tempted to text my tech and, you know, set up that whole thing. But for now, I don't think that's going to happen at least. How about this? Tell me in the comments below if you think it's worth it to do that. Should I should I gut the electronics and the bridge from here and put it in my thinner knife fly to really complete this process? Let me know, is it worth the price? Okay, so you can probably tell by now that I like black guitars with gold hardware. I've loved that colorway ever since I saw BB King and it has always stuck with me since. Getting a black knife fly V5 for under $1,500 wasn't the most difficult thing on Reverb. It took me a few weeks of constant refreshing and waking up early and, you know, checking in the middle of the night, but I did eventually get it done for $1,280. So this was $1,280, which honestly isn't bad for a knife fly in 2022. I wouldn't have cared if this guitar was beat up or full of scratches, but it happened to be in pristine condition, which was an added benefit, I suppose. The Parker Knife Fly trim arm comes with a little foam tip, as you can see here. And removing this foam tip is the first uh, alteration I make to every Parker Knife Fly guitar, as you can see on my guitar here. If you watch any of my videos, you will probably notice that I like to play guitar with the whammy bar in my hand pretty much at all times. And having that little foam tip, making it a little bit thicker, 
is just a little bit more uncomfortable to use and it makes it feel a little bit less natural. This may not seem like a big deal, but I find that these little tiny details help uh, when you're trying to craft your own personal style and get comfortable with a guitar that you want to play for a long period of time. If you like the playing in that example, you can check out the link below, which will bring you to my free guitar community where I post tabs, backing tracks, and other materials for all my free lessons on this channel. Honestly, before anything else, I'm a guitar teacher and a music professor. Okay, so I knew I wanted to replace the stock tuners for gold ones. And in the past, I bought gold Spurzo locking tuners to go with gold hardware on my other guitars. I actually had the gold tuners back here. I had these since the time I was in high school and I've been putting them on different guitars depending on which is my number one guitar at the time. But after using them for 13 years, I decided I want to try something new, so I bought these Graftec Ratio tuners. If you're unaware, all guitar tuners use a gear system similar to a bicycle, whereby the manufacturer selects a ratio so that one turn on the machine head equals a certain amount of turns or quarter of a turns on the peg, the post itself. Now the Graftec tuners have a different ratio on each string, and it's supposed to make tuning more efficient. And I know what you're thinking at this point. Number one, I didn't need to upgrade the tuners to begin with because spurzel locking tuners are great. You're right. Number two, even if I wanted to change the color of the tuners, I didn't need to spend extra money on fancy ratio tuners. I could have just bought gold spurzel locking tuners again. And again, you're right. Both were honestly totally unnecessary, but let me quickly explain the cost and how I justified it in my head at least. You can get a new pair of gold spurs of locking tuners for about $85 online. I got the new ratio tuners for $105. So there's a $20 difference there. I could sell the old tuners that came with the guitar for about $45, which would bring the total cost down to about 60. Let's round up to 70 to account for shipping, taxes, and so on. So the real question is, am I willing to spend $70 to have something a little prettier and maybe 5% more efficient? And honestly, yes since I'm building this number one ultimate guitar and I only have one of them. But if I had a lot of different guitars that I used every day, I probably wouldn't upgrade them all with the ratio tuners. I did it just because this is my number one guitar now. I can also genuinely say that after months of using these ratio tuners, I do notice I can tune more efficiently and my weekly summer string changes have been a lot faster. Is it a huge difference? No, but again, it's a small luxury that I was willing to pay. The knife line nut and neck and uh, frets were all of course already perfect, so there were no upgrades needed there. I could have upgraded the strap pins to locking ones, but nowadays I spend almost all of my time seated, so it slipped my mind when I was making these upgrades. That being said, if I go back to playing more standing gigs, I'll be sure to make that $20 upgrade. The only other major upgrade I felt necessary was the electronics. Of course, I left the stock piezo system exactly the same, but I did want to change the pickups and control layout. By the way, if you're enjoying the video and the level of detail I put into these videos, give me a like so I know you like this format and I'll continue to make more of these at least one gear video a week. First, let me explain a little bit about my history with pickups and different layouts and configurations. And then I'll tell you about this layout and these pickups in particular. So my number one pet peeve with pickups is noise. And I've always had bad luck with living in places that contributed to even more noise with single coil pickups. So from the time I was a teenager, I pretty much immediately gravitated towards humbucker pickups. Then for years afterward, when I was studying jazz, I just left my guitar in the neck position and didn't really think about it much after that. But later I got back into blues and more funk playing and I started to miss that single coil sound. So the first thing I did was I bought two knife flies and I had them both modded. One with the Marzio area pickups, which were noiseless single coils. The second was this guitar back here, which has short thornbuckers in it. I ended up disliking the DiMarzio, so I opted to have the guitar back here modded to include um, a single coil in the middle and a split on the neck and bridge humbucker so that I could get 
single coils out of those pickups. That guitar then became my number one for a couple of years. The split coil sounds are great, but there were three things that bothered me. Uh, let me grab that guitar and I'll show you what I mean. So this is my prior number one guitar. Of course, Parker Nightfly and I have Shore Thornbucker pickups, humbuckers, and then I have a Shore single coil in the middle. The first issue I have with this guitar is that although I can split the humbucking pickups to single coils and the tone sounds nice, there's so much hum it is basically unusable. So there's too much hum in the neck, too much hum in the bridge when they're split, can't use them, issue number one. Issue number two is, although the hum canceling sound on position two and four, those sounds are really, really good. But in order to get to them, I have to do two different things. I have to engage the coil split and I have to bring it to that position on the five way switch. So you can imagine I'm playing a solo on my bridge position, my bridge humbucking pickup. And then I want to go to playing some rhythm guitar on position uh, four with the coil split so that it's hum canceling. To get there, I have to move the five way up. And then I also have to switch the pickup up to the single coil mode. So lead tone, rhythm tone. That may not seem like a big deal, but when you're in the middle of a performance, if you have to do too many things, uh, you're liable to make a mistake. And this happened to me many, many times. Issue number two. Issue number three is simple. The position of this volume knob is not good for me when I'm playing. And you can hear, even if I just pretend to strum here, that clicking is my fist running into this volume knob. It's painful, it's annoying, and as I'm doing it, I'm rolling down the volume, which is an issue. Issue number four is something that I have with most humbucking, humbucking pickup configuration. And that is the neck pickup and the bridge pickup usually don't match in terms of the amount of treble and bass. So if I'm on my bridge pickup and I have a master tone, master volume configuration, I'm on the bridge pickup and I need to roll the tone down a little bit to get a good tone here. When I go to the neck pickup, since the tone is rolled down, it's too muddy. So again, every time I switch between the two, I have to adjust the tone knob. And again, that's just too much going on in a live performance situation. And so I wanted to rectify all of these issues when I made my new number one guitar. And here it is. In my search for noiseless pickups, I stumbled across the Zex Coil Dual Tribuckers. And those are these pickups here. So these pickups have the ability to produce a humbucker tone, a noiseless single coil tone, and a noiseless P90 tone. Now I have a separate video where I demo all of the sounds of these pickups in extreme detail. And you can watch that one. I'm not going to do all of that here, but I'll tell you a little bit about them. I went for the humbucker single humbucker configuration and they were very expensive pickups, but honestly it was very much worth it. And so if you think about it, when I have the humbucker in single coil mode and I have the bridge in single coil mode, plus the middle pickup I have here, this five way ends up acting like a normal strat with all single coils. And then of course I can do the P90 stuff. I can do the humbucker stuff, so on and so forth. It's really a great layout. Let's start with the issue with the volume knob. As you can see, I simply have the volume knob completely removed. And so I'm not running into anything when I'm playing. Instead, in the tone knob position, I have a stacked knob. And so the bottom taper is volume and the top taper is tone. The tone knob, the top taper tone is wired exclusively to the bridge pickup. So I can set my bridge pickup sound. I can leave my neck pickup the same and not mess with it. And the tone knob is not affecting the neck pickup. This is a great solution, but to be completely honest, these pickups are voiced so perfectly that I end up not needing the tone knob anyway. However, it's there for the bridge pickup if I need it. Now, the next thing I wanted to do, of course, was get all of those great tones out of these humbucking pickups, right? I wanted to be able to get that noiseless single coil tone, the noiseless P90 tone, but I didn't want to have a lot of switches in the way of my hand, and I didn't want the switches to be too complicated. So we came up with a solution where I have just one three-way switch here wired to the neck and one three-way switch wired to the bridge. And so I can control the voice of the pickup independently, uh, be it humbucker, single coil, or P90, and I can do that separately for each pickup. That's amazing. The last thing we have is this on-off switch, which controls the bridge pickup. So if I'm in the neck position and I hit this switch on, I then have the neck 
and bridge pickups together. And of course I can do single coil humbucker P90 for either one. Then if I'm in this position, which is usually neck and middle, and I have this switch up engaging the humbucker, I have all the pickups together. And that's actually a really cool usable tone. It's a very funky tone. The last thing I wanna mention about this layout is that you'll notice, although I have a lot of switches, they're all down and away from this area of the guitar. So this area of the guitar is completely clean. So when I'm playing, I'm never running into any switches. I'm never hitting anything by mistake. I'm never changing the tone unless I wanna change it. And I really enjoy how this all works. The pick guard is custom from WD Parts, and I just called them and asked them to remove the volume knob hole, and so there's no volume knob hole on the pick guard, and that looks nice. As I already said, I hate noise that isn't coming from my hands, and so I wanted to make sure the guitar is as quiet as possible. I usually put some electrical black tape right here on the strings behind the nut, uh, because that makes sure there's no ambient noise coming from here. Right now it's not on here because I've been playing around with some behind the nut bending stuff. I did opt to go with noiseless springs and these are made by Floyd Rose. I will leave a link to them in the description box. And these are very, very quiet and I found them to be very useful. I have them all over my guitars. And the last bit of noise fixing. So there is a very, very small gap between the saddles and the bridge. And believe it or not, that little quarter eighth of an inch spot creates a lot of string noise when you're playing these particular guitars and bridges. So what I do is I take a little piece of electrical tape and I just place it on the high strings in particular right between the end of the bridge and the saddle and that completely dampens all of the rate uh, all of the noise from behind the bridge. And so those little small alterations make this guitar completely silent. No ambient noise from up here, none from behind the bridge and none from the springs in the back. So we're at the end of the video you see I put over $1,000 into a $1,200 guitar, give or take. And so now the guitar's total cost is well over $2,000. And you're probably thinking to yourself, there's no way that was worth it. 
Well, to be honest, for me, it completely was, and let me explain why. I tried many guitars in the $2,000 to $3,000 to even $4,000 price range, okay? I tried the Ibanez AZ series, the highest model. Really great guitar, but I couldn't get comfortable with the forearm contour, and the pickups just weren't working for me, okay? Not to mention I couldn't play comfortably. I had to return that guitar. I tried an Aristides guitar. Very, very expensive, very, very nice, amazing guitar, but the neck was too thin and it was hurting my hand. Had to sell that guitar. I've tried multiple Kiesel guitars. Kiesel guitars, again, are amazing. I really, really like them, but they only offer two neck profiles. One is standard. The second one is the standard extra thin, something along those lines. The standard, uh, the standard thickness is just too thin for me and it hurts my hand. I tried Carvel guitars. Again, great guitars, but the model that I liked, which was the Guthrie Govan signature model, was even more than this guitar. So trust me, before I went through all of the hassle of modifying and creating my own custom guitar, I tried everything from $500 up to $4,000 and $5,000, and this was the best thing that I can come up with in terms of price. That being said, there is one guitar brand that I tried that rivaled the Parker, and that is VGA. And to this day, I the only brand that I think is as good of quality for me in particular, and the only neck that I really enjoy as much, or maybe even more than a Parker neck, is the VGA neck. If you wanna know more about VGA guitars, I have a review on one of them coming soon. Until then, I'm Andre Flood, and I'll talk to you soon.